Now, obviously, all the, the headlines have been about Greece. Um, I'm sure you've seen in the papers that uh, the Greece populace voted overwhelmingly no to the latest offer from creditors. So, you know, that's really why we're seeing markets down across the board today. The funny thing is they're actually quite significantly higher than, they, uh, than the futures market suggested they would be, looking particularly at the, the Germany 30. If you look at the lows that we have on our charts, close to a 400-point open, uh, open to the downside we're expecting at one point, but we're down in the region of 180-odd um, points at the moment. So quite a pull off the lows. And, uh, you know, there's different factors when we're looking at different markets. Equities, you know, I'd still judge it that, uh, particularly in Europe, we've got the, the European Central Bank putting a floor under equities with the um, with the quantitative easing program. You know, that's the backdrop that we have here. So can't let Greece distract us too much from the overall scenario. That's obviously why we're seeing a drop at the moment. But quite a few people looking at this as an opportunity to, to buy equities at, at cheaper levels, um, particularly in the U.S., Obviously, they're just less directly impacted by Greece, but nevertheless, their markets are dropping alongside ours. Um, we're just going into earnings season in the U.S. When you're looking at the euro, that's all a big lower gap lower on on Sunday. But we've actually filled that gap lower again a bit since then. Um, but in the case of the euro, again, uh, you know we've had some some fairly decent economic data from Europe in the past few weeks. And equally, we had the U.S. jobs number on Friday, and that missed expectations. Uh, a subcomponent of that was wage growth, and uh, that completely missed expectations, was just zero. So no growth in, in wages on the month. And so when you, you know, when you trade in the euro, obviously Greece is big, uh, but keep the overall context in mind about you know, the sort of macroeconomics behind the, behind the euro uh, and the, the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. So in terms of economic data this week, um, for, but really not too much today. Uh, there's U.S. services PMIs later. I'll pull up sterling um, just because I think the next big one is U.K. industrial production tomorrow. And obviously we do have the budget today, which is unlikely to cause any massive swings in sterling, I would judge, but uh, certainly possible. So this is uh, my sort of reasoning on, on sterling at the moment is that we did make a new high. Um, we had a, we'd had a strong run higher, though. And um, when it was sort of a strong run higher like that typically sees um, a sort of stronger, stronger correction, particularly when we've only just about made it past that previous peak. In my judgment, though, we are still just about in, a, in an uptrend. Um, that, that can obviously change the, the, move, the further we move lower. But for me, still, while we're above uh, 151.80, uh, we're still okay for an uptrend in um, the British pound against the dollar. And we're coming into a cluster of potential support here from this old peak. You know, so that's what you see in uptrends, obviously. You see a, a new higher high being made, and then oftentimes you'll see the, the higher low being formed in and around the previous peak. And we've got a couple of moving averages there to help justify that, coupled with a 61.8% retracement. Now, I think where we are at the moment is about a 50% retracement, and it's also this, uh, this, this sort of place that we saw a slight dip on the 11th of June. So we're getting a bit of a bounce from there. So certainly could move higher from here, and you know anyone looking for longs down in this region would miss out. But this, to me, seems like a, a cluster of potential support that if, if, the, if the pound is looking to move higher, that... that uh, that's a possible area. Supported that, you know, sometimes the RSI can be useful. Um, you know, it's been quite useful in terms of just moving between the uh, 80 on the top side and then this 35 level on the downside has been useful. So once we touch that area, uh, you know, um, that again could coincide with this, this general support area here. Not quite sure UK industrial production will be the one to do it, um, but obviously we've got the dollar side of the, the coin. And um, on Tuesday, we've got the US trade balance, so that'll be important. You normally get a bunch of ref, um, revisions of uh, GDP after the trade balance. And then probably the most important thing of the week uh, for currencies is we've got the FOMC minutes on uh, Wednesday. So let me just uh, let's have a look at the euro as we get into that. So 
did do a foreign post today, just on the one-hour chart, just demonstrating this Sunday gap. So that was the extent of the gap. And you can see, no mistake there, that we opened on uh, on Sunday there. Well, sorry, we finished Friday there, opened on Sunday there, and you know we almost perfectly rolled over after after covering that gap. Now the general trend is low. This is the short-term 200-hour moving average. But this is the 200-day moving average. We're well beneath that. And we're pretty much forming some, um, you know, we're still within this kind of range environment. So I think still 108.20 uh, could provide some support if and when we get down there. But in this shorter term scale, uh, looking at maybe sort of a four-hour chart, we're in a sort of choppy-ish downtrend. That said, it's going to be a bit of work to get through because uh, through through the uh, sort of 109.550 type area because that is a gap down and then a close higher. So that's a huge candlestick. Um, that was uh, well, that was Monday last week, a week ago, when we heard some comments from the Euro Group that the Greek deal was um, looking promising. Um, obviously, that didn't that didn't uh, that didn't pass. But there's still hopes of a deal, even though the Greeks have voted yes. And so, game is not over yet. Obviously, the US. Uh, Euro macroeconomic factors, as I just mentioned, involved as well. So this could be a big one to bounce, and we have already seen a move higher to fill the gap from there. Maybe we'll get a false break below here, and then we'll. I think probably the biggest tell will just be what will the daily candlestick do in and around that support area, which I do think probably on odds on chance was going to get tested. And if you're looking at this range. With this, the likely next area of the support in the range and a sort of general choppy downtrend, odds on it's going to get broken. But if we do get a move lower and then a close above it again, that's kind of a false breakout and could suggest a move back up to sort of 130, 114 type region. Not too much in the way of European data to affect this, so I think it is going to be largely sort of Fed speculative uh, flows that um, that affect this. We've got quite a few Fed speakers this week, actually. Um, they don't show up on the, the economic calendar on CMC markets, so good to be aware of those. We've got Williams speaking on Wednesday, uh, Kuchelakota on Thursday, and then Yellen, the most important, on Friday. Mm. Obviously, the, the chair of the Fed on Friday. Um, incidentally, we've got a bit of Chinese data this week. Um, Chinese markets have been pretty crazy of late. You know, the, um, the kind of cash index that um, is a good one to follow on CMC markets is um, Hong Kong's China listed eight shares, so the, the kind of mainland shares, but as they're trading on Hong Kong, these have not seen the same level of volatility that the the actual Shang, uh, Shanghai exchange has, uh, but still, uh, you know, you can see a pretty sharp kind of downside correction here. And this is even after, um, over the weekend, the Chinese government instituted a few reforms in terms of margin, et cetera, to try and um, boost confidence is with regards to the stock market, um, some specific rules regarding stock markets, which are supposed to be supportive, but the Shanghai exchange did close higher, um, but in the context of recent volatility, not not by much. Mm -hmm. So, um, but Chinese data nonetheless this week, um, that's also big if you're trading the likes of uh, gold and some of the other minerals, and, uh, sorry, metals. So if we look at copper today, I'm, I know I'm bouncing around a bit, but I'm trying to keep it in the topic of China. Uh, we've got Chinese CPI and money uh, on Thursday, uh, money supply on Friday. You know, just look at um, just look at copper today, getting absolutely trashed, <coughs> moving um, a, similar, a similar amount lower to oil. Um, we'll talk about oil in a second, but um, this was actually quite a nice technical move in copper because again, just Back to that, uh, you know, lower, lower low, lower high, lower low, and then the lower high made in the region of the previous lower high, uh, lower low, beg pardon, and uh, we've made a new lower low today. And um, 250 is a big round number, so I might get a bit of a reaction from there. It's also where we started to see things break out uh, back in January. But, uh, you know, these are the lows, the sort of 245 that really need to be tested. 
in copper. So I think there's quite a good chance at this point, especially in light of this crash that's taken place in Chinese stocks and the sort of overall slowdown in the Chinese economy. I think there's a good chance we move down to those lows in copper. Now, um, <clears throat> since we're on commodities, and I did just mention oil, Brent's getting pretty heavily smashed today. Um, might be worthwhile referring back to uh, my snapshot video from Thursday. I did talk about this rising trend line and the implications of a um, one of the first um, increases in uh, inventories. After nine weeks of drawdowns, we saw an increase in U.S. oil inventories, sort of indicating that, again, supply is overwhelming demand a bit in the U.S., and we saw some of the reason for that, just it's gone, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> just it's gone Friday, when uh, the uh, Baker Hughes rig count showed an increase in the number of rigs in the U.S., so companies coming back in and trying to take advantage of this higher oil price since we bounced at the start of the year in the U.S. And uh, so not good for the sort of general supply dynamics, uh, that supply glut scenario coming back in. And, um, and, and um, absolutely makes sense in the context of this broken rising trend line that I mentioned in the, in the snapshot video. And we're seeing some pretty fast moves lower as of Friday and today. And to me, uh, 57, 57.20-ish is a 50% retracement, and people will definitely have their eye on that because, uh, you know, that's just a half correction back of um, the, the move since January to, from January to May. Um, but there is an even stronger confluence of these lows and the 61.8% down, uh, down here in the region of 55 so a couple of levels to keep an eye on. You know, the momentum is to the downside at the moment. So in terms of short-term trading, you know, um, your best your best odds below all these moving averages is to the downside. But just keep an eye on these support levels where we could see a more significant bounce. The situation looks pretty similar in WTI. where we had this um, this little sort of triangle pattern here where the um, price just was not able to get through. Didn't close above 61, I believe. You know, 61 was a big one, but we saw a few spikes above and made this 61.50 the sort of significant area. With this rising trend line, broke through, nice little retest on the next day's candle, and then just tanked ever since. So um, I also highlighted this in the chart for the fact that we'd broken through the RSI support too. So when you see those two things matching together, a breakthrough that, you know, bounced off the 200-day moving average, closed below the 50-day, the you know, then closed below the rising trend line, retracement, saw the same in RSI, broke below, retest. You know, this is all quite, I mean, there's obviously benefit of hindsight here, but this is all quite textbook trading. So uh, if you are in this trade, you know, the question then is obviously where do you um, – where do you look to um, cut your losses? Um, well, sorry, um, take your profits. Um, hopefully you've decided that already, um, but uh, just for the sake of interest, I would say this is a quite a pivotal breakout area just from this high here. But there's a few of them. You know, you could even use this. This is where we are at the moment. It does coincide with this low here. So I do think that perhaps we might end up closing above here today. Um, we are heading into that 30 area on the RSI, so that's, I don't think that's the be all and end all. I think we have turned a corner here in terms of uh, oil speculation. That could cause a bit of a bounce in the time being, but I think we're probably heading down to the, um, you know, this peak or, or this low, which is in about the sort of the same vicinity. Basically around that $50 ball away. You know, we got to 60, tried to get up to 70, failed, heading down to 50 is, uh, is my very simple logic on this. Uh, but um, we've got Iran trying to negotiate a deal with the U.S. Um, over the, its nuclear treaty. Um, if that all goes ahead, it sort of looks like it's probably going to. The U.S. seem pretty keen on it. Um, then that opens up less sanctions for Iran, more oil supply, and um, 
that coupled with what seems to be a bit of a turnaround in U.S. oil supply, as uh, as we just mentioned, in terms of inventories, the number of rigs, then um, you know it started to slant oil towards the uh, the downside. Not calling for a break of the lows just yet, but um, I don't think there's really the justification for higher prices, and um, I think 50s on the cards in uh, in WTI. Uh, gold. You know, today is um, a day where there should be a massive flight to safe havens. It's not taking place. Gold is just looking pretty weak in general. Um, we had weak, I mean, I say weak, weaker than expected U.S. data on uh, on Friday, which probably reduces the odds of a rate hike in September for uh uh, you know, for the, the Fed to act and, and raise interest rates for the first time in September. But still, over 200,000 jobs were created. <clears throat> and wage growth over the year, it's not fantastic, but it's still 2%, so it's not, uh, it's not negative or anything. So um, still, still a rate hike this year is, is favored by most economists, and the market puts it sort of at the end of the year towards the start of next year. So that being the case, um, even though U.S. data was, was um, you know, this is Thursday where gold came lower, perfectly bounced off of the, uh, the sort of previously drawn declining trend line through the lows here, um, got a good bounce, formed a, um, a hammer, a candlestick pattern off the lows, was looking good there based off of that non-farm payrolls data, but almost no follow through since. Obviously Friday was a very low volatility day, so you can't read too much from that, just because it was the US uh, July 4th holiday. But today, tried to move higher, and it's sort of opposite looking chart almost to the Euro and to um, European stocks, where it's, um, you know, it's actually tried to push higher and then close the gap. So pretty weak action from gold and um, suggested to me that we're probably going to push through and try and test this one, um, 145 ish type low. Um, but, you know, that said, I can see there would be a, we, you know, we've got to get through the bottom of this candle first. So we could again bounce off the bottom of the trend line. If we've got a little false break and then a close higher again, that would support to me this, um, uh, this hammer pattern. And then we could get a push back up to uh, seems to be a bit of a confluence of resistance from a potentially a potential declining trend line there. We've only got two touches on it, but also this previous peak. Keep in mind, of course, that the um, the averages are generally sloping down, but it's a bit rangy. So you sort of bias to the downside, but don't expect to get too far with it. That's I think the general idea with gold at the moment. So typically I'll do indices first, but I have been doing it last this time around. Let's get over to those though. We'll start with the um, UK 100, which typically when there's good news on Greece, it underperforms, but when there's bad news on Greece, it outperforms. And so it's 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 still affected, in the UK economy is still affected by the, the European economy, so it tends to move in, a, in the same direction, but just sort of to a lesser extent. And so we're seeing that again today. Obviously, the UK, in terms of its mining stocks, are a bit more and more exposed to China. So we saw some, um, you know, this, this uh, volatility in China on their um, stock markets. Um, it's, you know, it's not that the stock market movement affects the economy, but obviously you need people investing in Chinese businesses, and um, you know they are going to be the same kinds of people that are investing in the stock market. So it just sort of dents overall investor confidence in China, uh, which is not what they need when the economy is slowing anyway. Um, so at the moment, we're potentially looking at a double, little double bottom in the UK 100 here. Uh, we're below all the moving averages, so that doesn't help um, any sort of long trades, but still, we've got to keep the kind of longer term uh, perspective in mind here. You know, we still, even though we've kind of broken through some quite significant lows, we're still generally speaking, you know, we're above this 200 week moving average, for example, which matches this low from Jan 11th. Um, uh, you know, above that area, 
there are still going to be people looking for, um, you know, looking for a bargain and buying into the uh, the FTSE. So short term weakness, but just remember there's going to be some some big longer term buyers coming in at some point. Um, so a chance of a double bottom here if we do close below. I think we're probably looking at six three hundred, but uh, if we do manage to hold above, chance of a move back up to the peak, and then perhaps a, um, you know, perhaps that's the end of this this correction that we're seeing. We start to to drift higher again. Um, you know, this I, I guess sort of more generally in this, you know, this if you are going long here, you've got to expect it to be a, a choppy ride in the UK 100 because the short-term trend is downside. So there's going to be people looking to, to sell in the short term. So every every kind of rally you get is going to face some selling and it's going to be a sort of um, choppy up the stairs movement. And it's going to be, you know, a worry every time you hit some big overhead resistance that um, say sellers may overwhelm again and push us into new lows past the 6500 uh, mark. Prop across to Germany. Now we've still got this uh, this channel still in play in the Germany 30 at the moment. Um, below are, are short-term moving averages, but the uh, the bottom of the channel coincides with this low from um, Feb 9th and the 200-day moving average. So we could see a push through past there because a lot of people are going to be watching that level. Well, I suspect that will hold to some degree, and um, I think if we do get down to those that kind of level, it will help us get through 11,000 again. Again, just generally the idea that, um, of course, Greece is a major headwind, and if they go spiraling out of the eurozone, who knows quite what the consequences will be. Uh, but still, at the moment at least, the eurozone economy is ticking over quite well, and again, we do have the um, quantitative easing from the ECB, which is, is a bit of a sort of ongoing um, possibility that if things do start to look pretty crazy in Greece, they could actually increase the size of their purchases. Obviously, that was not the original purpose of the program. It was to fight inflation, which has been um, – uh, fight deflation, rather, which has been receding recently. Um, but they could create themselves a new mandate to um, increase purchases as a sort of uh, economic emergency measure. <clears throat> It's a possibility. I don't think it's going to happen, but uh, it, you know, it, it could. And if it did, I think that would be a game changer for, for the equities, at least. Mm. And uh, over to U.S. markets as we approach the end here. Again, let me know if there's any particular, maybe more slightly strange currency pairs you've been watching, or anything along those lines. I'm happy to, to talk about them. Mm. This is the the US 30. I've drawn this this um, <clears throat> this uh, rectangle along here. Just sometimes helpful to sort of keep the, the general context in mind here because we've got the moving averages on, which are good when it when it's a trending market. But at the moment, it's really not trending in the US. It hasn't been trending since the start of the year, even into the the end of last year. And so, you know. Don't read too much into the fact that we've broken below the 200-day moving average because it's really just not a, um, you know, a lot of people will be watching that, but it's not a trending environment at the moment. Equally, the fact that we're below that these short-term moving averages, you know, we've been above them, we've been below them, above, below, above, below. That's a range, that's a range market. Um, you know, some indications to suggest that perhaps we're moving out of a range environment into a downtrend. Um, but until we get through this, um, this sort of 1740 to that 17,000 round number, uh, until we get below that, you know, I'm pretty hesitant to say that we're outside of the range. I think there will still be people looking again, similar to the FTSE, looking for um, looking for for bargains above that 17,000 mark. So. US 30 looking very sideways, but if we look at the um, US SPX 500, a slightly different picture. Um, 
bit more upward sloping and a bit more of a breakdown from that upward sloping picture. You know, this is the 200-day moving average here, which we've got to bounce into, came into uh, resistance against this, this rising trend line, rolled over again, now we're below it. Now this is potential support. <clears throat> this to me is quite a, um, you know, recognizable rectangle that a lot of people will, will be aware of on their charts, sort of, you know, I guess you could just draw it like that. Um, so, you know, below that, then you're looking to sort of the extended bottom of the, the rectangle down to sort of here. I've drawn trend lines, but, uh, you know, you can just keep it, just keep it simple with the horizontal lines. So I think quite simply, if we do get below this area here, it's quite pivotal. We've got a few rising trend lines in between, but I think it could open up a move down to this um, 1980 again. So here, here's the definite. Oh, we've already seen a, a strong reaction higher. So if we do get a bit lower, and again, it could be a sort of false break lower and, a, and then a move back up again. If we close below, um, to me, that, that certainly confirms a downtrend. Um, and then uh, you try and look for lower risk opportunities after that. Um, obviously, we're quite low in, in, the, um, in the scope of the correction. So you don't want to be selling too low. But um, a, cl a close below here, I mean, to me, would be some, some good confirmation for a move down to this, these rising trend lines as, as next potential support. Probably going to, again, as we mentioned earlier, largely depend on the FOMC minutes this week. Um, the, think of the, um, the context of that is that the last statement was on the dovish side. At least it was interpreted that way just because there was no specific reference to um, September being the uh, the key sort of lift-off date, um, which there probably never was going to be. They felt want to leave themselves some flexibility, um, but also no real strong language about the strength of the the, um, the labour market. Just an a recognition that it's picking up, but talking about weak wage growth, which we saw confirmation of on Friday, and. Um, no explicit reference to the dollar, but um, that's that's something that we could see in these minutes again, um, talking about a um, you know the effect of the uh, the strong dollar on the um, on the U.S. economy and on and U.S. corporate profitability. They're not going to mention that specifically, but you know, under, you know, that's going to be another theme in this upcoming earnings season is <clears throat> the fact that the dollar is still broadly stronger than it was, a lot stronger than it was a year ago. And uh, you know these multinationals are going to be affected negatively because of that. Um, so obviously those minutes are a bit out of date because I don't consider the um, last jobs report that we had. Um, so maybe the minutes plus Yellen's speech on Friday will give us a kind of true context as to which to um, to understand the situation in the. Um, in the dollar and U.S. stocks. So um, I think we're going to call it a day there. I think I've covered all of what's relevant for the upcoming week. Uh, good luck with trading, and I'll catch you at the same time next week. Jasper Lord signing out. Thank you.